mixing things up a little bit. So I've been dipping my toe back into this uh, lefty YouTube thing after some years. And uh, I think there's a little bit of a gap in what we're doing. We've got conservative response videos, debunking videos, pop culture analysis out the wazoo. And of course, I did some of that myself very recently. A lot of critiques, in other words. But I haven't seen so much detailed, serious argument in favor of socialist positions. So that's this video, The Case for Medicare for All. Let's nationalize the entire health insurance industry. Before I get going, this is adapted from a chapter of my upcoming book called How Are You Going to Pay for That? It goes on sale January 25th, and if you like this video, there are 10 more chapters just like it in there. I would greatly appreciate it if you could pre-order the book. Failing that, smash the usual buttons and sound off in the comments section to trick the algorithm into promoting more left-wing propaganda. All right, let's get going. Chapter 1. The Most Expensive Healthcare on Earth So most Americans know that our healthcare system is in sad shape. Something like 30 million people are uninsured. Even if you've got insurance, it usually sucks to use. People get incomprehensibly huge surprise bills. And on and on and on. But that just scratches the surface of our problems. Everything I just said now is very real and in fact much worse than that little summary makes out. But what it ignores is the vast amount of money we are paying for that objectively horrible service. A lot of countries have bad healthcare because they're poor. They just can't afford the latest technologies, pharmaceuticals, uh, good doctors, and so on and so forth. But America is rich. The richest large country, in fact. And we spend a greater fraction of our economy on healthcare than any other country, by far. Yet for all that money, we have the worst health outcomes of any rich country, by far. When it comes to medical care, we are getting ripped off coming and going. What gives? Let's talk money first. According to the OECD, in 2019, the U.S. spent 16.8% of its GDP on healthcare. $10,948 per person, or $3.6 trillion in total. I'm using numbers from before 2020 to... Uh, so the pandemic doesn't give us a misleading impression of how things normally work. The second place country in relative terms, Germany, spent just 11.7% of its GDP on healthcare. That's a 5.1 percentage points of difference. If you do the math, that's something like $1 trillion over and above what Germany is spending relative to the size of our economies. And you know what they say, a trillion dollars here, a trillion dollars there, pretty soon you're talking about real money. So why the hell is American healthcare so expensive? Before Obamacare was passed back in 2010, there was a common narrative among liberals that the answer was overutilization. That is to say, too much treatment. In The New Yorker in 2009, Atul Gawande made the case that fee-for-service billing models in Medicare and elsewhere were incentivizing doctors to overprescribe treatment. After interviewing a whole bunch of people, he surmised that medical providers were, quote, racking up charges with extra tests, services, and procedures. This idea made it into Obamacare in the form of a Cadillac tax on certain very generous healthcare plans. Though it was never actually implemented, it reflected a belief that the way to get health spending down was to make it more expensive to access care, so people wouldn't use so much. The overutilization argument is intuitive, plausible, and certainly partially correct in some circumstances. But as an explanation as to why America spends so much more than other rich countries on healthcare, it is definitely wrong, and it's not hard to see why. All you've got to do is compare it to other rich countries. Irene Papa Nicholas and several other scientists and doctors published a study in the Journal of the American Medical Association back in 2018 looking at this question exactly. Oh, hello, Kitty. It's a few years old, but not too much has changed since then. What they found was very interesting. Americans do indeed rank at or near the top in MRI scans, cesarean sections, and knee replacements. But that type of thing is not what people generally go to the doctor to do. If you look at broader measures of utilization, like visits to physicians and the hospital, or the length of stay in a hospital, Americans rank toward the bottom compared to other rich countries. We're not just behind the leaders in some categories, we're below average in every category. Moreover, fee-for-service medicine is or has been the practice in countries like Japan, Denmark, and Canada for many years, and none of those have seen the kind of decades-long skyrocketing cost bloat that the United States has seen. And so what's going on? The Papa Nicholas study has some answers. First is administration. The U.S. spends about 
8% of its healthcare budget on administration, which is the largest of any peer country, double the share of the Netherlands and quadruple the share of the UK. And much, much larger in absolute terms because the American pot of healthcare money is so big. That one isn't hard to figure out. The U.S. healthcare system has multiple complicated, often overlapping parts. Medicare, Medicaid, the VA, the Child Health Insurance Program, the Indian Health Service, and all of the dozens of different private insurance companies. And they all have their own little bureaucracy for payment and billing. Pretty much anyone who has ever used American healthcare is familiar with the hell of bureaucracy or in to get just about anything done. Millions and millions of people are being paid top dollar to push paper around in circles. Yes, Kitty, thank you. You're, you're helping me very much. The second obvious factor is drug prices. Here we are just getting straight ripped off. Cat. Americans spend about 15% of our pot of healthcare money on drugs. Again, the largest fraction of any uh, peer country and by far the largest absolute total because our pot of healthcare money is so big. We're talking half again what Switzerland spends, twice what Britain spends, and four times what the Netherlands spends. That in turn is because of high prices. The Papa Nicholas study looked at a number of drugs and they are the most expensive in the U.S. in every case, ranging from about 50% more to quadruple what other countries are paying. The third factor is the rest of medical prices. The Papa Nicholas study doesn't look at this directly, but it does find that American doctor salaries are the highest in the world, especially specialists. The Kaiser Family Foundation has examined a number of procedures specifically, and they found that compared to peer nations... The prices of heart procedures, MRI scans, or knee replacements are higher in America and often much higher. A concrete example might bring this into better focus. In 2018, the Wall Street Journal published an investigation into a Wisconsin hospital's knee replacement billing practices. For a decade, they had increased their list price by an average of 3% a year, basically because that's what everyone was doing. And that led to a figure of over $50,000 by 2016. Yet the hospital had no idea what the overhead was for this procedure. So they hired some consultants to figure it out. After some months of study with folks walking around with uh, timers and spreadsheets and whatnot, they found an overhead of $10,500 at most. And that includes all the super high doctor salaries I was mentioning earlier. Now, the list price is not what everyone pays for their procedures. That is typically subject to negotiation between uh, the insurance companies and the hospital, and that was secret until recent regulations from the Biden administration. But the list price is still a reasonable rough guide as to what people are paying. And here this hospital was clearing something like an 80% margin on one of the most common surgical procedures in the country. And this hospital isn't even that bad. Another study picked out the 50 most blatant price gouging hospitals in the country and found them charging uninsured patients up to 10 times the cost of care, and sometimes even more than that. Reporters like Sarah Cliff of the New York Times have made this sort of outrageous price gouging a source of regular coverage. Stories abound of people seeking minor treatment and getting gargantuan bills. Even when the insurance covers a bill like that, the cost still shows up in higher premiums for everyone. So now that trillion bucks starts to come into focus. Ruthless price gouging is why American healthcare has gotten more expensive for the last 20 years straight. The Kaiser Family Foundation, again, produces annual reports on this question. They found that between 1999 and 2021, the average annual premium for employer-sponsored insurance increased from $2,196 for a single person and $5,791 for family coverage to $7,739 and two, uh, $22,221 respectively. That far outstrips the rate of inflation uh, for that entire period. What's more, since 2009, the fraction of plans with a deductible over $2,000 has increased from 7% to 29%. Even Medicare is getting steadily worse over time, with the program covering a smaller and smaller portion of medical expenses because of skyrocketing costs and holes in the program that haven't been patched. In 2018, enrollees spent an average of $6,168 out of pocket. Worse, Medicare has been partially privatized under the Medicare Advantage program, which cost about 30% more 
because the insurance companies that run it have figured out various ways uh, to cheat the government. Basically, American healthcare has become a semi-deliberate fraud scheme, and it's eating the entire economy. Each year, providers jack up prices as high as they possibly can, and they hide those increases behind the incomprehensible bureaucracy of the system. Each year, insurance companies raise their premiums and push more costs onto individuals. Each year, Medicare and Medicaid get more expensive. Each year, American workers lose out on wage increases that instead go to health care spending. Result. The world's most expensive healthcare that straight up sucks. Quick update. After I wrote and recorded the script for this video, a new law actually went into effect that was intended to ban surprise billing called the No Surprises Act. It was passed some time ago, but I didn't think it would actually happen. Whoops, that's my bad. It's a pretty significant improvement on some of the problems I've been talking about so far. However, it is very far from a complete solution. The good news is that if someone ends up in an out-of-network provider, they are legally forbidden from charging more than the in-network price most of the time, and insurance companies are required to cover the cost. Quite a few of the horror stories I've mentioned thus far theoretically shouldn't happen under this new system. The bad news is that the No Surprises Act has a lot of holes. It doesn't help uninsured patients at all. They can still be stuck with any kind of bills. Providers can request that patients waive surprise bill protections and refuse care if they don't agree. There's also not much to guarantee that providers won't file balance bills anyway, because the penalty for doing so is only $10,000 if you get caught, often only a tiny fraction of these kind of bills. Providers are constantly violating regulations like this. News organizations are already writing articles instructing people on what they should do if they get an illegal bill. Most egregiously, it doesn't cover ground ambulance bills, which are the single largest source of surprise bills and probably the easiest way to get one. Aside from specifically surprise bills, people can still be billed normally in vast quantities. The out-of-pocket maximum rule under Obamacare is $8,700 for individuals and $17,400 for families, which is trivial to rack up with a serious illness. The Federal Reserve says that as of the last quarter of 2020, 35% of Americans could not cover an unexpected bill of $400 out of pocket, let alone $8,700. Overall, like Obamacare, this is a welcome reform that nevertheless will not solve most of the deep problems with American health care. Anyway, my friend Libby Watson has a great issue of her newsletter Sick Note on this new law, which you can find in the description. Onward. Chapter 2 the worst healthcare in the rich world. After all this, it should come as no surprise that American health outcomes are middling to poor. If you look at the broadest measure of population health, average life expectancy, we are firmly at the bottom of the Papanikolas study. Oh, and by the way, since those numbers were published in 2015, uh, American life expectancy declined for three straight years, and that was before COVID hit. America is particularly terrible about childbirth. We have the worst infant mortality and the worst neonatal mortality and by far the worst maternal mortality. More than twice the second place UK and six times that of Denmark. So it's true to say that the profit motive has infected virtually every aspect of med American medicine. But this has had contradictory effects. On the one hand, people who do end up in the clutches of the incompetent, predatory medical system do often end up getting more tests and treatments than they otherwise would. But that has created a provider culture that is so ruthlessly predatory that everyone who isn't desperately ill or injured tries to avoid it if they possibly can. Again, you can see this in the Papa Nicholas study. America tops the charts in the fraction of people who have skipped needed care due to cost. Let me share a personal story. One time I got very sick, possibly with the flu or something like that. I had a high fever. I was feeling really bad, exhausted, but I couldn't fall asleep. So I took some NyQuil to help me get some rest. That was about six o'clock and I fell asleep. And then I woke up at about midnight and uh, couldn't get back to sleep. So I went to the bathroom to uh, get a drink of water and you know, get another dose of NyQuil. And right there, for the first and only time in my life so far, I fainted. One minute, I'm reaching for the medicine cabinet. The next minute, I'm draped over the tub in the bathroom. My first reaction was confusion. How in the hell did I get in this tub? And then alarm. You see, my girlfriend at the time had panicked, obviously, and called 911. An ambulance was on its way. 
instantly dozens of stories about people being ripped off for their life savings by ambulance companies flashed through my head. My first thought after I figured out what was happening was to tell my girlfriend that she should cancel the ambulance. I hadn't hit my head. I hadn't broken any bones as far as I could tell. I wasn't bleeding. So I'd probably be fine. Let's not risk it. But the EMTs were almost there already. So they came in and looked me over and they found that my oxygenation was fine. Um, I hadn't broken any bones or anything like that. My pupils were dilating properly and so on. I hadn't gotten a concussion. So I declined the ambulance ride to the hospital. Instead, I triple checked that the local hospital was in my insurance network and then uh, took a taxi to the emergency room. There I sat for four hours and uh, they ran some tests and they couldn't figure out what was wrong. And so they just gave me a bag of IV saline and sent me home. So my hunch that I would have been fine without getting a once over from a doctor turned out to be correct. But I didn't know that with any certainty whatsoever at the time. What I did know for certain was that anyone who seeks medical attention for any reason in this country runs a sizable risk of financial ruination. When you're feverish or exhausted or recovering from a fainting spell, in my experience, it's pretty easy to talk yourself into thinking that you're probably fine, or that you can tough it out, or that you don't have any other option. People in much, much worse situations of mine have come to the same conclusion. It's frankly incredible and more than a little depressing that we tolerate this kind of stuff. Chapter 3. How do we fix it? You might be thinking at this point that we should set up one big healthcare market. If ruthless providers are jacking up prices, well, let's make them compete and make things cheaper. And in fact, that was some of the impulse behind the design of Obamacare. Now, right off the bat, there are problems. People who are sick or injured are not at all in a good position to make decisions about buying or selling health care. Most people don't know what the proper treatments are for various ailments. And if you're in an emergency situation, it's literally impossible to shop. What, you've been shot in the leg and you're going to look up on Yelp as you're bleeding out who's got the best uh, practice for stitching up a femoral artery? The very idea is ridiculous. But even if we set that aside and assume that market forces work perfectly for healthcare stuff for the sake of argument, the outcomes would still be abhorrent. What markets do is allocate scarcity by price. That means if you have some condition that costs more to treat than you personally possess, you're not getting that treatment. Poor people will not be able to go to the doctor for basically anything. Middle class people will only be able to get routine care. But if they get very sick, they will be bankrupted and die. Only the very rich will be able to afford any kind of healthcare treatment. That is obviously a monstrous outcome. And thus, while Obamacare had some market mechanisms in it, it also had a ton of regulations to prevent that sort of a picture I just sketched from occurring. So first it had guaranteed issue regulations, which meant that insurance companies had to offer uh, coverage to everyone. Then it had community rating regulations, which meant that you couldn't charge sick people more than healthy people. Then to compensate, it had the individual mandate to force people to buy insurance, which was meant to prevent the possibility of healthy people opting out and causing an adverse selection death spiral, where only sick people who need care that costs more than they can afford opt into the insurance marketplace and the whole thing just folds in on itself. It turns out this wasn't even necessary, but that's a topic for another video. Then there were regulations about the medical loss ratio, which required insurance companies to spend a high percentage of their revenues on healthcare rather than profits. Then there were risk adjustment regulations, which transfer money from insurers who had uh, healthier populations of enrollees to popu uh, insurers who had sicker ones so that companies couldn't benefit by trying to scoop up all the healthy people onto a particular plan uh, with advertising or something and thus, you know, creaming a lot of profits off. That only scratches the surface of the regulatory complexity. It just goes much deeper than this. If you think this sounds like an overcomplicated mess that gives private companies about 10 billion ways to exploit the system anyway, you would be right. Democrats set up a marketplace, and then built a Rube Goldberg machine to prevent the market from doing what markets always do in almost all of the circumstances in which it functioned. And it still didn't produce the one they were aiming for. So while Obamacare did extend coverage to considerably less than half of the uninsured population, mostly through its expansion of Medicaid, it totally failed to halt the growth in healthcare costs. In practice, the exchanges have become a super expensive and janky supplement to Medicaid. We need to rebuild the system from the ground up. 
We have too much predatory profiteering, too many fragmented and overlapping systems, too many well-intentioned but incredibly complicated and burdensome regulations that don't do what they're supposed to half the time or more. And especially too many people with no health insurance at all. What we need is something big and simple. All the American people in one big insurance pool to spread the risk as widely as possible, which would cover all medical care of any kind. If providers are charging too much, one big plan with every American on it would have unparalleled leverage to control costs. Let's call it Medicare for All, like Taiwan, Canada, and Australia did when they were designing their health insurance systems. Conceptually, it's not hard to see how it could be done. Just sweep all of the existing federal health care programs together, add coverage for vision, dental, and long-term care, and anything else that is missing. Remove all cost-sharing, control prices and fund the balance with tax money. What a Medicare for All system would cost would therefore depend on how we set it up, because it would effectively be setting prices for the entire healthcare system across the board. We could save as much or as little as we want to. So let's aim for spending 12% of GDP, or $2.6 trillion in 2019, roughly equivalent to Germany in terms of the uh, share of our economy, and we'll fund the balance with taxes. It's probably not necessary to set up a dollar-for-dollar dollar tax scheme to pay for this thing, but that's a topic for another video. That still gives us the most expensive healthcare in the world, but only by a small margin instead of a really big one. And it should still surely be enough money to provide quality uh, healthcare to the entire population. So to get there from our current position in terms of spending, we need to find about $1 trillion. So starting from the insurance side, let's assume that Medicare for All would have uh, administrative costs of 3% of spending. That's the same as Canada or Australia who have similar programs. If anything, this should be an underestimate because of uh, economies of scale over a large population. That gives us administrative costs of $80 billion or uh, about $200 billion in savings. So we're 20% of the way there. For drugs, let's stipulate a budget of $800 per person, which is toward the high end of comparable countries. This would be reasonably straightforward. Instead of drug patent holders charging the profit-maximizing price to individuals, leading to things like a new cure for hepatitis C costing $84,000, the medical price regulator, as the sole purchaser of pharmaceuticals, would set prices commensurate with the social utility of each treatment and the cost of drug development. And then Medicare would pay for it rather than a single person. Alternatively, we could set up a price system for drug development, but that's a topic for another video. That gives us a drug budget of $260 billion per year, which should be easily enough to make sure that all Americans get the treatment they need. That gives us further savings of roughly $275 billion for a running total of $475 billion. The rest of the savings is going to have to come out of providers. Here, it's impossible to even guess at the details of where the money might come from because we don't have a set of comprehensive price data for all medical procedures in the country. We only have some initial stuff because of new regulations from the Biden administration. And we see wild discrepancies between different providers for the same treatment or discrepancies be, uh, at the same provider for the same treatment, depending on what kind of insurance somebody has. This stuff is just all over the place. It simply must be the case that we could wring out enough savings that medical providers could get by with only $2.26 trillion, which means we need another savings of $525 billion. I'm sweeping together all remaining categories of spending under providers, which is not strictly accurate, but it's close enough for our purposes. So there's no way to say in advance how this could be done, because as we've seen, the prices are all over the place. But if every other rich country can do it, certainly we should be able to do it too. The first order of business for a Medicare price regulator would be to conduct a nationwide audit of medical pricing to root out cost bloat, waste, and outright fraud, which, as we have seen, saturates the entire medical sector. Once the government has a grasp of the average cost structure for hospitals, clinics, and so on, it can adjust prices for them just like it would do for drugs. It would be a big pain in the ass, but it could be done. Finally, there's the question of revenue. Current health care programs directly funded by taxes or tax expenditures cost about 7.6% of GDP. That means we need to find something like another 4.4% of GDP in taxes. 
That's about $820 billion in 2019 or $2,500 per person. Though obviously we'd want to levy that tax in a progressive fashion rather than the head tax that de facto exists now uh, in the private insurance marketplace. Now that's a pretty considerable tax, but it's far short of what most people are already paying in premiums. And once we got our new system up and running, the vast majority of Americans would see their incomes increase. Anyway, this is all just back of the envelope stuff, and it's really the best that anyone can do. But what it proves is that Medicare for all could definitely work if we had the sufficient political will. If we really did it, no doubt the precise figures would be a little bit different here or there. But given the titanic quantities of money that we waste on the status quo, it simply must be possible to bring the system roughly in line with what other rich countries are paying without breaking the bank. Chapter 4. We're already paying for it. So far, I've been talking a lot about complicated details of taxes, funding streams, pricing details, on and on and on. Boring. But don't let your head get too lost in the weeds here. For example, when Bernie Sanders was running for president in 2016 and 2020, people were constantly on his case about how he was going to pay for that. Now, he had a pretty good answer, which was to say that the tax increase to fund his Medicare for All program would be less than what people are currently paying in premiums, uh, almost all of them. And so most people would be money ahead. And that's indeed how we set up this, uh, this system uh, just previously. But we're now in a position to understand just how diluted that question is. These chumps make out like Medicare for all is going to be some huge new burden on the pocketbooks of the American people. In reality, we are already paying for it through the nose. If we count insurance premiums as taxes, which they basically are because they're mandatory in a practical sense, American workers are the second most highly taxed in the rich world, just behind the Netherlands. U.S. workers pay fully 43% of our income in taxes and mandatory payments. Then on top of that, we pay enormous out-of-pocket costs in the form of deductibles, co-insurance, co-payments, balance bills, and so on. An average of $1,230 per person in 2019. Just about half of what we would need to fund Medicare for All right there. And then we pay for it in terms of taxes to fund Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, the VA, and all the various other government programs, which most of us aren't even eligible for. There really is a crisis of affordable health care in this country, but it comes from the hideous complexity and corruption of the status quo that causes us to flush trillion dollars down the toilet each and every year. Done properly, Medicare for all would halt the cancerous cost bloat in health care spending that is devouring the economy sucking our national wealth created through the collective effort of every American into the pockets of a few. We can't afford not to do it. Chapter 5. Choice That Destroys Freedom I briefly want to address the issue of choice, because this bugs me to distraction. In his presidential campaign, Pete Buttigieg argued that his Medicare for All Who Want It plan was better because, quote, I trust you to choose what makes the most sense for you, not my way or the highway, end quote. In a campaign ad, a voiceover said the following. He's trying to focus on choice, not infringing on people's freedom to make that decision voluntarily. Now, Pete was lying about this as usual. His plan almost certainly would have led employers dumping their employees onto the Medicare system by the tens of millions, and that would have been good, but... Let's set that aside. The idea here is that in order for Americans to enjoy healthcare freedom, we need to construct a policy system where we can pick from a variety of healthcare alternatives. Immediately, you can think of a lot of ways in which healthcare choice sucks. On the Obamacare exchanges, you typically get a choice between a plan that covers an arm and a leg, but covers more care, versus a plan that costs only half an arm, uh, but doesn't really cover anything. That's more like gambling with your health than a free choice. But if we grant Mayor Pete's point for the sake of argument, constructing a choice-based system forecloses the option of having a single high-quality system for everyone. It's the paradox of non-choice. Requiring me to make a choice means that I don't get to choose the option where I don't have to make a choice. And that is what I want. Personally, I don't want to choose which of 47 different insurance options are the best for me. And even when I try, I am probably not correctly calculating which of the 
different 47 page insurance contracts is the most uh, sensible for me and my family and my lifestyle and my health background and all of that shit. And I pay fairly close attention to this stuff. When I have to do open enrollment or shop on the Obamacare exchanges or the private marketplace before Obamacare, what I do is look at the horrifying tangle of options, none of them very good, get increasingly frustrated and just make a rough guess. I think that's probably what most people do. Am I wrong? All I want to do is to be able to go to the doctor when I'm sick or injured, for Christ's sakes. I would pay a lot of money in extra premiums just to not have to bother with this crap. A system that ostensibly increases my freedom and my choice, in fact, forbids me from choosing the thing that I want most by far and forces me into a situation that I fear and hate. If I were shoved onto a Medicare for All system accompanied by a sharp tax increase, I would feel profoundly relieved. My lived experience of freedom would be drastically improved. No longer would my insurance be chained to my job. No longer would I have to worry about balance bills. No longer would I have to do any of that insurance paperwork every year. Chapter 6. The Glorious Possibility of Medicare for All. All this sets me up for what I think is the most underrated argument for Medicare for All. Reduce stress. Set aside technical details and just think for a moment about what this would mean in terms of living your life on a day-to-day basis. Have you ever worried that if you're fired or laid off, you're going to lose your health insurance coverage? That's gone. Worried about turning 26 and getting kicked off your parents' insurance? That's gone. Fighting with the insurance company every time you need care? Gone. The annual enrollment nightmare on the Obamacare exchanges. Gone. Worrying that you're going to be bankrupted every time you get sick or injured, whether you're insured or not. Gone. Worrying whether or not your hospital or the doctor the hospital might be contracting with without telling you is in your insurance network. Gone. Every American who is under 65 and not very rich, and I'm talking at least top 1% money, has this financial sword of Damocles hanging over their head at every moment of every day. We all know it's there, even if we can forget about it consciously for a time. We've all heard the stories and the news, or from friends. We know that if we get badly sick or injured, there's a substantial possibility that we're going to be financially ruined. Even seniors run the risk of getting ripped off by the uh, companies that run Medicare Advantage. I think most Americans don't realize what a burden this constant thrumming fear creates. I didn't really feel it myself until I fainted and the first thought that came into my head was about money. Medicare for all would end that forever. Nobody who passed out or got sick or got brutally injured would ever again think to worry about payment. If you need to go to the doctor, you could just do it without money ever entering into the equation. Tony Benn explained how this is a founding value of Britain's National Health Service in the film Sicko. This uh, leaflet that was issued, very, very straightforward. What year was this? This was 1948. Your new National Health Service begins on the 5th of July. What is it? How do you get it? It will provide you with all medical dental and nursing care, everyone rich or poor, man, woman or child can use it or any part of it. There are no charges except for a few special items. There is no insurance qualifications, but it is not a charity. You are paying for it mainly as taxpayers and it will relieve your money worries in times of illness. Now, somehow that the few words sum the whole thing up. I'd wager quite a lot of money that Medicare for all would lead to a measurable decline in the rates of anxiety, depression, addiction, alcoholism, and all that sort of thing. On the other hand, a comfortable medical safety net underneath each and every American would be gloriously liberating. I would bet that a good number of people watching this video right now are working at a shitty job that you hate because you can't afford good insurance on your own. Or maybe you want to start your own business or set up a freelance career, but you haven't done it for the same reason. Or maybe you want to start a family, but you can't afford the probable massive hospital bills for prenatal care, hospital delivery, putting your kid on your own insurance, and so on. Or maybe you want to move to another place. Maybe you've got a long-distance girlfriend or boyfriend, but you can't do it because you're on Medicaid and they live in a conservative state that has onerous qualification requirements. I could go through stories like this all day long. Kitty, The American healthcare system traps almost all of us like this in one way or another. Imagine how much different your life might be if you knew for a fact that whatever else happened, 
you'd always have health care. God, wouldn't that be great? Well, that's it for now. Again, if you like this video, you can get a lot more stuff just like it if you order my book. Pre-order link is in the description. It's also available as an audiobook, so you can check that out too. I performed the audiobook, actually. Thanks for watching. Kitty, you are a silly kitty. <laughs>